Welcome to Masters of Regeneration Radio. Conversations with humans who dare to reimagine our place on planet Earth. Earth is changing fast. Evolution happening in real time. An intimate, circular understanding of nature and living systems. We are the land. The land is us. You are listening to episode 8 of Masters of Regeneration Radio Conversations with humans who are brave enough to reimagine our relationship to planet Earth. A friend in New York asked me a couple days ago, what was the difference between industrial agriculture and regenerative agriculture? I'll give you guys a quick example. In industrial agriculture, you take a piece of land and create a vegetable or fruit factory. Let's call it a raspberry factory. You want to make it as productive and efficient as possible. You want to get the most efficient genetically modified seeds and use pesticides and industrial fertilizers to achieve your goal of making as much food and as much money as possible. In regenerative agriculture, instead of creating a food factory, you decide you're going to manage an ecosystem where raspberries will grow. You manage your soil, cover crops, bee population, maybe you encourage bird of prey population so that they eat the possible rodents that will come and eat your raspberries. You use compost, uh, less water, you don't need pesticides, you reduce water consumption and ultimately manage the health of the soil so that it becomes richer every year. Two very different models of reality and our relationship with the planet, both profitable. One makes the soil and the environment toxic, and toxic food as well. The other replenishes nutrients, makes the most nourishing food, and helps capture carbon from the atmosphere. It's okay, we had to make mistakes to relearn all of this, and we're moving in the right direction. Guys, we're a small team doing all the research, editing, and producing of the show so if you like masters of regeneration radio this is a reminder please it would mean a lot to us go to itunes and give us five stars and if you have an extra 30 seconds or so give us an awesome review today's guest is andre loy the international director of regeneration international it is an organization that promotes food farming and land use systems that regenerate and stabilize climate systems the health of the planet and people communities culture and local economies democracy and peace through their multilingual website and social media networks through consumer campaigns international conferences they organize and sponsor regeneration international provides information and resources that highlight the connection between healthy soil regenerative agriculture and land use food, health, healthy economies, and climate change. Andre Loy lectures and teaches at universities, institutions, and workshops around the world. He speaks at numerous conferences, seminars, workshops, as well as United Nations events on every continent. He meets with governments, industry, farmers, consumers, and NGOs on the multifunctional benefits of regenerative agriculture and on the science of increasing soil organic matter to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. Regeneration International works with numerous agricultural systems such as agroecology, organic permaculture, ecological agriculture, holistic grazing, biological agriculture, and agroforestry. Andre is also the author of Poisoning Our Children and the Myths of Safe Pesticides. He was the longest serving president of IFOM Organics International, the world change agent and umbrella body for the organic sector. He has over 45 years of experience in all areas of agriculture, from growing, pest control, weed management, marketing, post-harvest, transport, grower organizations, developing new crops and education. Andre has been actively involved in developing new crops, products and the markets for these crops. He has a long history of problem solving to innovate new methods of production, promotion and overcoming market barriers. Andre and his wife Julia, who's the mayor of the Douglas Shire, have an organic tropical fruit farm in Daintree in Australia. 
You are listening to episode eight of Masters of Regeneration Radio. Andrew, welcome to Masters of Regeneration Radio. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here, Thomas. You are the International Director of Regeneration International. Yes, uh, because I've, you know, I've actually had a lot of international experience. Uh, recently, I was the president of iPhone Organics International for six years and before that, vice president. But for the last 40 years, I, I've been active internationally on every continent with uh, organic and, and regenerative agriculture. Beautiful. Are, do we... Except for Antarctica. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> well, not a lot of organic, but, but, regenerative agriculture. No, not, not the animal and no, plant not, not and mineral them. action down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but unless I was about to say, you know, part of what we're trying to do is actually stop the need for actually having regenerative agriculture in in Antarctica, given the way things are going with climate change. Oh God. <laughs> Yeah, things are things are. Um, I've spent some time in the Caribbean right now, and there's something going on really strange with seaweed in the Mayan Riviera and the Gulf of Mexico, and then Miami's full of some other toxic algae, and it's pretty scary. <laughs> Uh, and, and you'll see that all around the world. I, I, I live in northern Australia um, where the Great Barrier Reef is and we're having similar issues with um, eutrophication, that's the nutrients coming off, uh, off the land and particularly farmland and causing algal overgrowth um, you know, o over the top of corals, for instance. And You call that, that nutrification? Eutrophication is the word for when you've got extra you 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 trophication okay. and that that that's the technical term for saying you've got too much too many nutrients in water gotcha. so it starts going you know with the creeks and rivers and you get algal blooms and and that takes out the oxygen and you know kills fish and then it you know it goes out into the seas and the oceans so for instance you know, the what kind of nutrients of the are we talking about? Well, well generally, um, nitrogen and phosphorus are the two main ones, yeah. and, and most of that is from agriculture. Yeah, yeah. So what they do is they feed algal blooms, and when the al algae grows, it actually takes all the oxygen out of the water, and that uh, kills the other species. So you end up yeah, with yeah. these dead zones, oh and the God. classic is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, that's coming from the Mississippi. There are dead zones like that all around the world, the Bay of Biscay, of France, the Mediterranean. You know, we start looking at all our river systems and, and the man-made nutrients that are coming out are killing the uh, biodiversity in these ecosystems. And, of course, you know, the if you want to talk about the Gulf of Mexico, you know, um, that's really like a big lake and while you've got a dead zone in the middle nutrients are now affecting you know the whole of that region and that's why when you want to talk about um florida or going to the caribbean and, and and so on it's all part of that same ecosystem it's all connected yeah of course and so there's Right down in the Caribbean, there's sargassum seaweed, which Ooh. I read comes from the sargassum sea, which is kind of like in the middle of the Atlantic, right in front of, of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. But it's caught in a loop and it hasn't stopped. They said yeah. it used to come a couple of times a year or something like that. But now for the last two or three years, it's just been coming and coming and there's mounds of sargassum seaweed. The other issue in Miami and South Florida is that there's a red tide and there's toxic algae that are different yeah. from the sargassum seaweed. Do you know anything yeah, about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you've got two two issues there. So the red tide is the classic eutrophication, uh, and uh, that that feeds, you know, in this case, toxic algae. Okay, and you know, and you know. That that coast of uh, 
of Florida now. You know, <laughs> you're, you're finding manatees and and dolphins and fish being killed because not only the loss of oxygen, but the fact is that the algae is toxic. But you know, the the same is happening up in Vermont from oh, wow. the from the dairy, for instance, um, the um, CAFO dairies and all the nutrients coming off to the point where people um, can't touch the water in some of the lakes because the algae is toxic. You can't swim in it. And, and Vermont so, is seen as lovely and green, and but but. Can the, you explain what CAFO the, dairy is for people who are not familiar okay, with the term? Yeah. Confined animal feeding operations. There you go. Animal prisons is the best yes. way to put it. Yes. Cruel animal prisons. Cruel animal and, prison. Well, they are. Yeah. You know, that's what they're it is. jails. Yeah. And, you know, but they're also incredibly environmentally destructive because you've got um, an agriculture that feeds them, which is a monoculture, which is just absolutely the local environment using heaps and heaps of toxicides plus all those nutrients which run into the river systems in the Midwest that go into the Mississippi. Then all that feed gets trucked across the places, you know, um, that feed these uh, animal factories, animal prisons, and then they have these big that they don't know what to do with. And all that nutrient... Manure, all oh, the manure yes. that's, that comes out, um, and that then goes and pollutes the waterways again. So, in the case of Vermont, it goes into to, to, to the lake systems. But you'll find that th this will be the case, you know, uh, all around the USA, where where it's, uh, where there are feed animal lots. feeding operations. Yeah. Yeah, feedlots, exactly. Okay. You know, whereas normally what would happen in nature and what we, we advocate in, in regenerative, regenerative agriculture, uh, holistic grazing systems where animals um, go through the pastures naturally as they, they would, the same way as the herds of bison did over the prairies. And, you know, that um, manure is, you know, put onto the ground mixed in with the grass and stubble that, 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 that's left over and essentially composts and builds up the soil. And with these systems, you, you're doing the opposite. Instead of all the nutrients washing out, we're actually using those nutrients now to build up um, soil organic matter, in other words, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah and improving the fertility and at the same time reversing climate change because we're taking the main greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil yeah. as against the, the, the feedlots where, you know, they're not only putting out all the, you know, the um, carbon dioxide, you've actually got the, the manure breaking down into methane which is uh, 20 to 30 times stronger than carbon dioxide yep. as a greenhouse gas. So we're, we're talking about two different systems, one that improves the environment and will reverse climate change as against one which is completely toxic, completely cruel and just doing so much environmental damage. Absolutely, yeah. That's a point worth repeating and that I try to just communicate all the time <laughs> because it's two completely different things. I, I think the first one is not even, I mean, yes, it's a system, but it's, it's still an outdated mindset of managing a product, which is a cow, or they see the cow as yeah. a product. They don't see the cow as an organism that is part of an ecosystem and a very complex series of events in the food chain. And then that there's the soil and that there's the sunlight and there's the grasses and the cow and, you know, and it's just in order to be the most efficient and possible and, and sell meat as cheap as possible without taking into consideration any, any of the, the consequences. Whereas the other one is what you're talking about in regenerative agriculture seems to be 
a change of mindset because you, you are like, oh, okay, I need to manage a whole ecosystem for this to become healthier and healthier as we as we move the cattle around and the soil gets richer and richer, right? Exactly. Uh, and, and, and you're right, you're talking about managing a whole ecosystem. And, you know, when we start looking at, you know, the Midwest in the past, years, the original prairies. And I don't know if people, any of your listeners have had the opportunity to actually go on to some of the remnant prairies in the Midwest, the tall grass and the short grass prairies. And you realize these are, these are some of the most beautiful ecosystems. You know, everybody thinks of just grass, but you walk through and you'll see all these different flowering plants that are absolutely exquisite, incredibly diverse with, with, with you know, 60, 70 species in, 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 in these uh, grasslands. 67 and species of grasses. Six, 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 60, you know, we're not, 70 or, species maybe. Because well, what we're talking about, you know, is all the different other plants, not just the grasses. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got, you've got all the you know, incredible diversity of plants that, that, that make up the prairies. And, you know, what we see we're, by bringing in holistic grazing, regenerative grazing systems, you, know, you can restore these ecosystems, bring back these prairies, and bring back you know this ecological health, bring back a system that that not only now is producing um, good quality healthy meat, but also within the system now you're bringing back you know this high diver- biodiversity of other plants and animals, other other native and endemic species. Yeah. So this is a you know. This is why we use the word regener- regeneration. We're not just talking about sustainability. We are regenerating systems, restoring these ecosystems, improving them. That, that's the whole aim of what we're doing. To, going from you know, what is causing the red tides off, off, off the, uh, you know, the coast of uh, you know, eastern Florida yeah. to you know, bringing back a you know, red tide, which is toxic and killing rare animals like manatees yeah, yeah. to, uh, you know, to restoring ecosystems. And that's, you know, that, that's what we're talking about. And, you know, that also goes through to our health. You know, people don't understand if you're eating this toxic food, food that is produced with toxins, that is also a major part of our Global health epidemic, what the World Health Organization calls an epidemic of non-contagious chronic diseases, cancer, heart disease, liver disease. We can go on and on, on and on with all the diseases that that, that people have. And these aren't contagious. You You don't get cancer by sitting next to someone in a bus. Yeah. Or in a restaurant. (laughs) No. Um, They're... yeah, kidney disease or yeah. whatever, you know, if I took asthma or eczema or, you know, you can go on and on and on. Alzheimer's or ADHD, you know, there's so many, many diseases. These are all lifestyle environmental factors. And if we want to look at one of the major causes, it's, it's in our food. It's the poisons in our food, the pesticides, yeah. but also the lack of quality of food as well. Yeah, it's like dead food or toxic food transmitted diseases, like FTDs or something like that. Exactly. It's really exactly. sad. Yeah, it's that's... really sad, you know, because when you have food that's coming out of a super healthy soil, it's not only more flavorful; it's packed with nutrients, <laughs> and it's what it's what drives life, right? <laughs> and exactly, you know. Yeah, because what we have is on one level, you know, when we, we, we're getting back to the, the feedlots or the factory farms, you know, the animal prisons, you're talking about a system that produces you know, what we call empty food, you know, this mass-produced food that is full of you know, carbohydrates, sugars, fats, and very, very little in the way of real nutrients. It's empty. Yep. And the word we're using for this food now is obesogenic. Obesogenic. You know, this is the wow. obesogenic yeah, like causes calories. obesity. 
empty calories, yeah, you know. Yeah. And people people are eating more than ever, but their bodies are literally starving yeah. because they're not getting all the, the, the real nutrients that they need. Yeah. doesn't matter how much they eat. These things are empty. Yeah. And so, I'm... you know, pe- people are... <laughs> Go ahead. Putting on weight, yeah, yeah. And, and and that's uh, causing another epidemic of type two diabetes, colon cancer, you know, and so on and so on. We know very well all the diseases that uh, you know obesity causes, and high blood pressure, high blood pressure, which leads to heart disease, strokes, and you know, this is an epidemic. Yeah, and. But we're talking about micronutrients, minerals, vitamins present in all foods, right? We're not just talking yeah, about anti- the macronutrients, which are proteins and fats and carbohydrates. Yeah, um, exactly. We're not talking, you know, yeah, exactly. Micronutrients, but also antioxidants. We just know how important antioxidants are to stop, dis- you know, chronic diseases like cancer, like Alzheimer's. You know, these, it's oxidative stress that causes a lot of the inflammation that leads to these diseases. Antioxidants mop up the causes of oxidative stress and they prevent us from having these diseases. And we also know that they're very good at um, helping heal us from these diseases as well. And we know by eating fresh food we get antioxidants and we know you know every study shows that organic food has around 30 percent more antioxidants than uh, conventionally grown food yeah yeah. good good scientific data on that so that's what we talk about getting food from regenerative systems we know that it's high in in really important nutrients yeah and so in in Obviously, in evolutionary terms, it's very the regenerative movement. I don't even know if I can say evolutionary because it's been so short, but it's been around the idea or of coming back to, you know, like I I, I did this interview with with an indigenous uh, apprentice from the Amazon, and he talks about how they manage all of life to keep it healthy in the jungle and how they have done so for tens of thousands of years. And so we're going yeah. back to that, but. Can we talk a little bit about all those the the things that yeah. pre, that would prevent people from going to buy or well obviously about what you're doing as well I want to go into that but what are all the the obstacles that we're facing right now to con, to 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 show to consumers that it's a lot more bang for your buck if you take care of your health and you eat good food that's full of nutrients you know because most of the yeah. time people say, well, oh. it's really expensive and I don't know where to get it and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd ask them what's more expensive, spending a few extra dollars on your food yeah. or spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, deal with cancer or heart disease or liver disease. Totally. You yeah. Know, yeah. What's more yes. expensive? Yeah. <laughs> Your doctor's bills for yeah. having a chronic disease. Yeah, yeah. Or spending a, and and having good health for the rest. But to me, it's a no no brainer, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. Healthy food, organic food, food from regenerative systems is the best bargain there is it's you know the word we're trying to use now is cost or true value and you know if you want to talk about you know the best way to say it you know do you do you want to buy high hyundai or a cadillac cadillac which one costs you more and why do you pay more for a cadillac because it's a better car it's the same with food yeah you know, yes you can buy empty junk food and it's cheap fine but you pay the price and you'll pay that price at the end yeah. with, with uh, chronic health diseases on the other hand you know pay a little bit more for a better product and in the end it's actually cheaper because you're going to ha- not have all the health bills you're going to have a healthy life and everything else that goes with it you know end of the day 
it is actually the best value. It's not about price. It is about value. You want to talk about good value for money. It's actually a bargain to buy healthy food. I it's agree. It's a bargain. I agree. Yeah. Where can people go and find – I mean, I know everything is a Google search away, but – is there a database that you guys have or that if, if someone types in regenerative organic farmers around me or something like that, will they find places? Uh, look, not at this stage. We're, yeah. we're using the word regenerative as a broad umbrella term for lots of different farming systems, not just organic. Organic is one. Yeah. And there's also, you know, the regenerative organic um certification standard now yeah, yeah. which is bringing in a you know higher or better level of uh, or organic products but saying that you know good organic is uh, you know we have the data showing that it, that it is so much healthier that it has better nutrition but very importantly is to be able to avoid pesticides but you know what my advice to people are is, you know, go to your local farmers markets. Yeah. Support your local farmers, and ask them, you know, um, you know, how do they produce it? And, you know, if they if they use pesticides, avoid them. You know, use, you know, same shops. You know, actually, you know, use your your dollars, your wallet. It's it's one of your most powerful tools to get change. And, you know, so when you go to the shop or supermarket, insist they have organic. If they don't, walk out. Go somewhere else. You, believe me, there's so many shops now. Everywhere you go, you'll find organic food. Um, every community has a farmer's market now where you can go every week and, 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 and buy fresh produce. And you can talk with those farmers and uh, make sure that the ones you're buying off are not using pesticides and are using organic or uh, permaculture or um, agroecological or holistic systems to produce their food. It's it's not difficult. It's just a, a small change. Yeah, yeah. And you know the other one for for me is you know get away from buying processed foods. They're toxic. Now, all the additives, you know, there's no science showing they're safe. Absolutely no science, no study showing one of these additives is safe. On the other hand, there are enough studies showing that they're not safe. You know, get back to good, healthy, wholesome food. You know, the you know, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, fresh um, meat, you know, really good dairy products, you know, Good whole grains, you know, just get back, you know, to pulses, you know, get back to good basic ingredients. If you do that, you know, you'll, you'll end up being so much healthier. The fact is, actually, you'll find by, by going and buying fresh produce instead of processed produce, you'll actually find your food bill will be cheaper. <laughs> Far cheaper in the end. You know, people say, oh, it's too expensive. It's, it's, well, yeah, yeah if you go to Whole Foods, money by you know, doing this. yeah, or the very expensive supermarkets, but look, going to the local, you know, um, farmers markets makes a lot of sense. I also find that something that gets in the way sometimes is that people think, oh my God, that's so much effort. What about, you know, this efficiency? I have my convenience store and my supermarket near me and I don't have to like, you know, but I think we're at a time where taking responsibility as consumers, like you were saying, we we can change the way things are and what whatever is being produced with our wallets, you know, with our purchasing power. And ironic, exactly. ironically enough, people don't foresee this, but by taking responsibility, all of a sudden you just, which happens in life, you just create a lot of freedom. You're all of a sudden you're free from whatever diet program they're trying to push on you, or this powerless feeling that you know you're sick and you can't do anything about it. You know, because just food exactly. is going to power you look, up. Look, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And look, I think that's the other really important thing is empowering yourself, making the change, and 
you know, honestly, the amount of people we know of who actually, you know, who, who are ill, suffering from, you know, different um, diseases, who actually make this change, who start healing themselves, and and going on the, you know, the word we're using is the path of wellness. <laughs> Let's start being well. The other one I get people say, oh, it's not convenient. Well, you know, what about now thinking about this idea of community? We're missing this now, you know. People's idea of community now is looking at a little screen, like an iPhone screen. Yeah. The, but, you know, actually going to a farmer's market and talking and interacting with people, you know, the lovely thing about markets is they're great social events. And you sit down and have a cup of tea or coffee or a fruit juice. And, and in the end, you know, the, the difference between the convenience store and, uh, and you know, the supermarket and the farmer's market is that every week, actually get to know the people in the stalls, you know, and you get to talk with them and, and you know, you get this wonderful feeling of community, you know, That's instead so of That's so true. at the moment yeah. people yeah. Are, are isolated. Yeah, you get to know that, them, you that's know, the other part. your dairy farmer's first name and their family and, you know, and probably you'll go and visit the farm yeah. if, you have, if you have time, you know, it's so fun. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I suppose what we're, when we talk about regener regeneration, you know, we're not just talking about improving the soil and the farming system. We're talking about regenerating our communities, yeah. regenerating our democracies, empowering people. You know, this this is the bigger idea of regeneration. We, we absolutely you know, yeah. at the moment, you know, you can say. You know, this whole thing of chronic diseases is, is, is a symptom of a greater malaise in society. And what we want to do is, is basically regenerate society. So we do, people start being more interconnected. People actually enjoy meeting with other people, you know. And that's, that's this whole idea of what we call, you know, a, a, a food and farming movement. We need to reconnect consumers with farmers through food. At the moment, it, it doesn't happen, you know. There's no connection between buying uh, something in a package yeah. and going to, to, you know, actually to a farmer's market. There you've got a connection. There you get to meet the farmers and, like you say, even go out to the farms. So I'm, I'm all in for that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, like I say, it's a change in mindset. It's a completely different understanding of what it means to, to be alive and how, what's our place in this thing and this food web that is just life on the planet, essentially, because we're so disconnected from that in big cities. It's hard to be connected to that when you're surrounded with concrete and with systems of, you know, efficiency and convenience. And um, what do you think, how does that translate to say, to go back to the seaweed problem and the dead zones and all that? I didn't know, I didn't even know there were the Mediterranean as well. I thought it was like a Caribbean and, and thing, but apparently not. <laughs> It's global. It's global. Believe me, all around the world, it's global. And look, okay, one, it gets down to our bad land use and what we do in the land affects the sea and eventually ends up in the sea and all the poisons and nutrients that we put into our river systems go out into the sea. But the other big issue that's happened is, is climate change. And climate change is now an existential threat to our existence. And, you know, at the moment we're fiddling while Rome burns. And this summer in the Northern Hemisphere is starting to become a wake-up call. Yeah. But I think the biggest wake-up call happened, you know, last week when we got the news that the ice pack north of Greenland, which is never, ever, ever broken up, broke up for the first time in, in recorded history and was never expected to break up. Wow. You know, that part of the Arctic ice. And, you know, it, it, you know th 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 this is really serious, the amount of ice that is melting, the heat, that, that it's, a, um, it's basically affecting our oceans. So this is what's happening with the Sargosso Sea. It's normally what's called... A, 
a gyre. It's a, it's, it's a stable area. It's actually, um, you know, if you read about um, <laughs> or the word this old sailors used to do is call it the doldrums. They get caught in that area. There's no wind. Yeah. And they could be there for weeks. But what's happening now is that with all this extra heat is is fueling our weather system in, in, in a, a more, how can you say, um, violent way. The, the best way to, to put it across, the, the world is already just under two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was in the uh, Industrial Revolution. Yeah, yeah. And if you imagine that, imagine the amount of heat you need to heat up, not just the atmosphere, but also the oceans of, of our planet by yeah. one degree, and that is more than billions and billions of atomic bombs worth of energy. And I want to use that's that a as a metaphor, yeah. a violent... That's a lot of heat. It's a lot, and I use it as a metaphor because I want people to understand now that that heat is basically violently fuels our weather systems. So when you start looking at things like hurricanes, the one Hurricane Lane that's just passed uh, Hawaii, you know, yeah, yeah. Hawaii never used to get these things. Yeah. Pacific because the water was too cold. That's changed. The water yeah. is is warming up. The and so what we're seeing by the water warming up and the air warming up that we're changing the air currents and we're changing the ocean currents. So what's happened in the Sargasso Sea, which used to be the calm doldrums, now you're getting these changes in currents, and that's pulling the seaweed out and pushing it towards um, the Caribbean. Yeah. And that's so it's because of change. the excess nutrients and the ocean temperatures rising, creating the perfect yeah, conditions. And because, for... Yeah, exactly. Perfect storm. <laughs> A yeah, nice way to put storm. it. And uh, confluence of, um, you know, uh, bad land use. Now, what with regenerative agriculture, what we do is we actually um, change farming from being a major source of uh, greenhouse gases. And depending on how you do the boundaries, it's up to actually 50% of uh, our greenhouse gases come from farming, you know, if we actually include all the externalities that, that actually really belong to farming. Now, what we can do is change it around the other way. So farming goes from being a major problem to being a major um, solution by using photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and, and water and uses sunlight and produces yeah. sugar or glucose, which is the basic molecule of life, and a byproduct of oxygen. Now, that carbon, um, you know, that is taken out of the atmosphere and put into plants, through the correct management now, can be put into the soil as what we call soil organic matter, building it up. And we can actually put in tons and tons of carbon into every acre of soil every year. And if you want to equate that across agriculture with billions of acres, you know, we, we can actually reverse climate change. We can actually take out more carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere at the moment by putting it into the soils yeah. and bring that's the amazing. climate back to the way it should be. And that is one of our major core issues in Regeneration International. We're, we're very, very actively promoting it, promoting these farming systems. We, we have very good examples of them. And the thing is I want to talk about here is we have the science, we have the data. These systems already exist. We don't have to invent anything new. Yeah. You know, this is shovel ready. All we have to do is educate and train farmers. Not only that, these systems are more resilient, so they're better against floods and droughts. They yield higher, so farmers yield, get more yield, yeah, and the they cost less. Healthy plants, they don't get any pests, you know, because they're too strong for anything to, like, attack them, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if we build, build the right systems, you know, what we say, healthy soil gives healthy plants. 
and that results in you know healthy animals, healthy people, and a healthy planet. Yeah, it's it's and so simple, right? In a way, <laughs> you think about it, and yeah. it's 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 a no-brainer. And we have the science. No it is a no-brainer, and we have the science and the practice. We have the evidence-based practice, and we know so many good examples, and and that's why we're working with you know, different like-minded organizations to scale this up because, you know, we can change farming from being a major problem to being a major solution and we can reverse climate change, bring the climate back to the way it should be. That's awesome. And we can do it in a yeah. generation if, we, if, you know, with, with enough will. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we've worked out with our best practice systems, you know, we only have to convert 10% of farming systems and 10% of grazing systems yeah. to best practice regenerative and we will reverse climate change. You know, it's not even a, a huge task. We don't have to do 100%, we don't, you know, 50%, 10%. It's not, you know, we, we do that, we start the, the process of changing the planet's climate back to the way it should be. That's definitely a no-brainer. And is it something that we need to tackle both on land and in the ocean or just taking care of the land is going to translate into seagrasses population uh, and also, you know, oceans being healthier and capturing... Well, oceans are acidifying because they're capturing too much carbon, right? <laughs> That's in the atmosphere yeah. anyway. But Exactly. Um, yeah. Look, look, essentially, the problems in the oceans yeah. are mostly, not, 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 not all, but mostly in part of the problems of what we're doing on the land because, you know, of the um, nutrients coming off and the pesticides and poisons coming in and affecting the ecosystem. The, um, the and the other one, of course, are uh, the greenhouse gases from what we're doing on the land. And, you know, that extra carbon dioxide going into the ocean and acidifying the oceans. Yeah. So, we, we, you know, we, we have to fix up what we're doing on the land. That is critical. But we also, you know, there are a whole range of things we're doing in the sea that are unsustainable. And, and our rates of fishing now. Yeah, are completely unsustainable, and and fisheries are collapsing. So, you know, we, I mean, the, we are, the ocean equivalent you know, of feedlots, and you know, poorly managed fish exactly. farms that just intoxicate the ecosystems around them. And yeah, That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that, but also overfishing, because then we're we're totally disrupting the whole ecosystems. Yeah, by by unsustainably, uh, you know, pulling out. Um, mining really um, yeah. unsustainably mining fish and seafoods so and a lot yeah of we have to fix up what we're doing a yeah exactly sharks, exactly too many you, sharks. Know. <laughs> you know yep yeah well now it looks like they, they, they can't get fish but they they, they can get us <laughs> <laughs> you know you guys you guys are having the same problems in the states same with us you know this whole, whole areas of people are too frightened to go um, surfing now. In fact, one of our major surfing competitions in the south coast of Western Australia at Margaret River had to be cancelled and moved because it's too dangerous to go in there now because of sharks. They're coming. They're you know, coming they're, for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you're talking about circular systems. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're catching my fish. Nature's All right. <laughs> <laughs> nature's revenge on us for, for disrupting you know if uh, we've taken all the sharks food then 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 maybe the sharks want us as food so yeah. it might be joking but there, there is a, an element and truth in that yeah. so we this is where you know we, we we have to really um regenerate our seas as well and and look can i say there's a whole range of things that do it if you look at you know, what we call blue carbon now, of how we can grow seaweeds and, and, and highly productive regenerative systems that we can use to produce food um, in the oceans, yeah. that you know, compared to the like you say the uh, toxic 
fish farm systems that we have at the moment, which are just polluting the um, the marine areas you know, um, that that are adjacent to them or in them. In the history books, there we will probably be that time in history when people came together f because otherwise, you know, Homo sapiens was just going to get fucked. Sorry, <laughs> but. Um, you know, it was like, yeah. it's the one thing that's gonna, that's gonna help. I mean, we need more education. We need to spread this message more. You know, this is like an open invitation for someone to become a responsible consumer and a conscious informed one as well, just because of, there's no other way. There's no other option. Yeah, look, look, exactly. And, and, and to me, this is really important because, you know, at the end of the day, the majority of people, everybody is a consumer doesn't matter what you are, you're a consumer because you eat and you buy things. Yeah. And being a responsible consumer is so important. And can I say it's why, you know, um, we work with the Organic Consumers Association in the USA. In fact, it's thanks to the Re Organic Consumers Association that Regeneration International has been formed. Yeah. And, you know, um, you know I come from the farming side, organic you know, farming side, but really – You know, to me, as a farmer, it's just so important for us to work with consumers and build these links and have responsible consuming because if we do that, that will drive change more than anything. You know, um, the consumer dollar is the biggest change driver that will make, you know, farmers change what they produce. If they can't sell their toxic crap, they yeah. will be forced to produce good quality regenerative products Absolutely. same you know with the distributors same with the you know the supermarkets and and you know the retail chains you know they will be forced to change because otherwise you know they lose money their business model goes yeah and can i say that is already happening that change it is has happening. started yes yeah 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 and i suppose what i want to end on Or yes. really talk about because you know we talk about all the negatives and they are major negatives and but they're important drivers for people to wake up and change. But to me, you know, I want to talk about that this change is happening and that this is really positive. You know, we are seeing this change. It's doable, and and talk about the positive message that you know we can be empowered to turn things around and we can turn it around within a generation. You know, and it's not difficult. And, you know, there's millions of us who are already on this path. Yeah. You know, and we, we need millions more to join us. And this is, you know, this is a quiet revolution, but it is a really important revolution. We have people from all around the world. And you know, we need more and more of us to, to do it. More and more people who join, the quicker this change will happen. And it is a positive message because oh, know, absolutely. we I mean, will improve yeah. our, our farming systems. We will reverse um, climate change. We'll improve the environment, stop you know, much of the environmental degradation. We'll improve our health. We'll improve our communities. You know, this is just win, 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 win. There is no downside. And what is really yeah. important is that we have every tool we need. We know how to do it. We are doing it. This is this is the really critical thing. People go, oh, we need to invent this or we need to research this. No, we don't. You know, yes, research can help make it better, but we don't need to wait. You know, let's you know get yeah. out there and do it now. You know, and it's as simple as making a choice in what how you spend your dollar. It is as simple as that. It is, and truly, making a choice yeah. that, yeah, and making a choice that you actually want to go on the path of wellness. I think that's the really important thing here. You know, if people go on the path of wellness and they want to be well in their own health, that changes your mindset. It changes how you spend money. That alone will change the planet, and we actually make a, a well planet instead yeah. of a sick planet. It's so many birds with one stone. It's not two. It's so many. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's a flock. Yeah, it's a whole flock of, of issues just from this holistic perspective. It's beautiful. It just makes so much sense. 
it's true you know well it does actually because it's actually you know it gets back to what we're saying the interconnectedness yeah yeah and you see either way you know we can interconnect a whole lot of negatives or we go the other way and we interconnect a whole lot of positives you know that that that's the multiplier effect i suppose or the, yeah. or, or or the concept of synergy where one and one doesn't equal two it equals three four forty fifty yeah. you know it's it becomes synergistic as as we go forward. I mean, the whole idea of this this program is definitely to focus on what's happening to drive positive change, yeah. not to talk about what's wrong, right? Yeah, but I think it's important. The reason why, you know, for instance, I wrote the book of pesticides. I was just going to mention people that. People yeah. understand. Yeah, it, 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 it's, especially on children, so people actually understand the seriousness of what's happening because that does drive change. Yeah. I think it's really important to say, no, things aren't right. Business as usual isn't right. And pesticides in our food is a really important issue and particularly for children and the developing fetus, the unborn, the newborn, and children at the puberty yeah. can be affected by the smallest amounts and it affects their development. And we actually know it can actually affect, um, f affect them for multiple generations. Wow. Through what we call epi epigenetic changes. Absolutely. And for those we also know through... don't know what epigenetic changes, that's the genetic expression, you know, because yeah, your genes exactly. are what... affected by your environment and everything that's your environment. Exactly. Look, look. Now, you know the, the model of um, genetics that that is used by the GMO companies and um, so on is really out of date. There's a really good model in the early 1960s when they first started to learn about genes, but you know, in the last 50 years, 60 years, science has moved on. They haven't moved on, but the science of genetics has moved on, and we now know about the epigenome which is a region outside of the genes that it basically is exquisitively sensitive to environmental factors. Yep. And they send the signals on how the genes work. And we understand this is really important. This is how we adapt to the environment, how we can survive in changing environments because of the, um, you know, our epigenome. Yeah. But because it's sensitive, we actually know that these synthetic chemicals now affect the epigenome yeah and they're synthetic we've never been exposed to them before these are brand new th things that we have not evolved with they're not part of our our um, normal um, genetic response so what they do is cause false responses they then affect genes turn them on too much or turn them down so for instance in some genes, if, they, if you turn them up too much, might cause cancer. Yeah. Other genes that you turn down, you know, that, that, that might mean, you know, your, your, your normal development of, of hormones or, or the brain or other parts of your body don't work properly. So, and we know that, you know, it's really small amounts that can do it. The, the other issue is what we call endocrine or hormone disruption. And this is really important in the development of, of the unborn, of the fetus, but also a newborn and also in puberty. These, these are major times of development hormones. And what, what these hormones do is they send signals to the genes to develop at specific times. So the, you know, the baby in the uterus, when it's developing, it gets signals from genes to say, okay, now develop a liver, now develop eyes, now develop your reproductive system, yeah. now develop your brain, now, you know, and so on and so on. And we know that the amounts of um, the, the hormone are parts per trillion. And a part per trillion is equivalent of one drop in three Olympic-sized swimming pools of water. That's how sensitive it is. Now, many of these pesticides um, work like hormones at these low levels. So instead yeah, of so getting scary. the normal hormone, yeah. Yeah, sending the normal signal for normal development, 
yeah. they get a false signal. So that affects the normal development. And the big trouble with these, these are sort of like programming events. You know, once um, the, the hormone signal uh, comes in at the wrong time, and, and many of them, for instance, work like our, uh, our sex hormones, like estrogen, and then they, they actually send in um, signals that affect the normal development. So we, you end up, you know, in, in boys, for instance, with a whole lot of um, what we call genital urinary malformations. We think we now know that it's, 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 it's a major reason for declining sperm counts, testicular wow. cancer. Yeah. and also pr prostate cancer late in life. In women now, we, we, we know very much that it's related to uh, you know, the epidemic of breast cancers and uh, uh, other cancers, ovarian cancer. We've got very good research showing that. And other cancers, cancers of the sexual tissues, um, diseases like endometriosis, which is now a silent epidemic amongst yeah. women, young women. Yeah, yeah. And in some cases, we can we, we can go back to it's actually grandmother's exposure to it. That's it's insane. Yeah, the granddaughter. Yeah, because we don't know the, the we don't know how long, generationally speaking, the epigenetic effects are going to be right. So no, we don't. Enough. Although we 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 are starting to get some information that three four generations it can fix itself up. Okay. If there's no more exposures, so uh, yeah. it, you know the you know you talked before about the circular organising principles. You know, we we can see this that if we if we take away the the what's causing it, the cause of of, of 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 the problem in this case the pesticide, eventually the system repairs. That's actually where the word regeneration comes from. Exactly. Um, the whole concept of yes. it is that. You can disturb an ecosystem. You take that disturbance away, and yep. the ecosystem will repair itself. Yeah. And it's the same with our body. Our bodies are a, a, an ecosystem. We take that disturbance away; those pesticides. Our systems will repair. In some cases, it'll take generations. Other cases, um, it can repair and 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 you know. Children and others can go on to live, um, you know, normal lives. Yeah. But, you know, so what I'm trying to get across here is that the amount of pesticides in food can cause these sm small disruptions to the normal development of children. And there is no safe level. The government say, oh, look, you know, it's so small it won't hurt. But the fact is they have no evidence whatsoever. There's not one scientific, published scientific paper yeah. showing that one pesticide is safe for children. Not one in the world. Not one. It's a lie. It's a myth. That's why I called my first book The Myths of Safe Pesticides. Yeah, absolutely. It is a myth. There's any science to show safety. But we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers showing that no level of pesticide is safe for children. Yeah. And this is why it's a very know, important we, we point to, to go to make a to you you know to make and I'm glad you're talking about this because most people are not aware of the the extent of the damage it can have on on their health and their children's health, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And 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 Exactly right. It, it, most people aren't aware, and that's why I wrote it. I want people to understand how damaging these are. And particularly, I want um, the millennial generation to understand this because they are, you know, father, you know, about to become fathers and mothers or just becoming fathers and mothers. This is the most critical time to avoid pesticides. Yeah. If you want the best for your children, start eating organic food now start eating food without pesticides now get yeah. your body healthy get these pesticides out of your system make sure you know that during pregnancy there's no and breastfeeding there's no pesticides the child gets no pesticides in their food give them the best start in life you know that's what as parents what we want we want the best for our children yeah and believe me you know the 
getting them pesticide free food is the best. Yeah, yeah. And also, I would also argue food that is rich in nutrients, antioxidants, as I said before, um, they will break down many of these toxins and stop the damage and prevent the damage. There's so much evidence now, um, you know, of having diets high in antioxidants will stop these damages, will, put, you know, will significantly prevent getting um, chronic diseases later in life. And, you know, just so eating a diet of that now is important for all of us, but particularly for future parents. And that's not just for women. We also know that the pesticides will affect the sperm. You know, we talk about epigenetic effects. Yeah. Those epigenetic effects can be inherited. So boys have to start eating good food as well. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, fertility but is the first. Both of us. Both fertility of humans and fertility of the soil. They're kind of like a metaphor for each other. <laughs> and, exactly. And the diversity yeah. of your gut bacteria. Sort of like those three are kind of like yeah. where, where everything happens <laughs> for life anyway. Yeah. Um, You're right. Yeah. It, it, it's so important. You know, we actually un to understand now that, you know, the importance of of that when you talk about the fertility and also, you know, we talk once again about ecosystems or, or biomes, you know, your microbiome, yeah. having a healthy microbiome is so important. Understand how, yeah. how important the mother's microbiome is to, for the health of, of, of children now, how that gets passed on at birth. Yeah. You know, so it is and, very and breastfeeding. Yeah. It is very scary to see that, some, I mean, there's so many hormone disruptors, not only pesticides, but, you know, like, that's why you should get, if you're going to get anything plastic or metal or glass, you need to make sure it's BPA free and all those things, because you're getting all yeah. those weird signals that your body, your biology is like, I don't understand this language you're giving me what's going on. I was reading an article um, about, you know, about the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, photosynthesis, and the water cycle, the four main, you know, cycles of the planet. And then there was a mention of another pesticide called atrazine, which is... Yeah, atrazine. Or oh, atrazine, I don't know how you pronounce Atri that. It's called atrazine, yeah. At yeah atrazine, yeah, yeah. which is like the second most commonly used pesticides in, in the US and Australia, I believe. And it's considered yep. a man-made cycle of the planet or something like that because it's so prevalent. It's so, it's kind of like just it's everywhere, everywhere. You, Europe, yeah. oh my God. Europe banned it because, you know, when they tested their, their, their soils, their water, even their rain, 8% of rain had atrazine in it. Oh my God. You know, um, and, and you know, it's just every, everywhere, but there's very good work done by Professor Tyrone Hayes showing how atrazine um, basically works as an endocrine disruptor and that actually feminizes males okay. and also at the same time, you know, it, it increases the risk of um, breast cancer in females. And that work shows that it lasts for three generations, that gr grandma's exposure will affect, you know, the granddaughters and grandsons. You know, it, wow. it's long overdue yeah. to be banned. It, it, it is just so dangerous. No level is safe. No level is safe. And it's ubiquitous. Ubiquitous through the environment, like glyphosate, the active ingredient of Roundup. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the Midwest now, most rivers and most rain samples, you know, you'll find it. You know, virtually everyone you test, all of us, will have levels of um, glyphosate and atrazine. This way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If it's That's going in the can... soil, it's going to go in the atmosphere and it's going to come that back down in the rain, and it's just. It, Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why we we we've got to um, you know do everything possible to eat food grown without it. And yeah, and, yeah. and people say, oh well, you know, what what can I do? Well, by 
eating food grown without it and buying food that's grown without these poisons, you force farmers to change to systems that don't use the poison. And this is the really important thing I need to get across, why buying, you know, buying poison-free food is a really important revolutionary act that will do more than anything else to change um, these systems. Governments won't do it. Governments are captive of, of the corporations, even though the science is overwhelming, showing how dangerous these poisons are, like atrazine, you know, there's good science, like Roundup, glyphosate. There's good science showing how dangerous they are. Yeah. Governments don't ban them. They defend it. They defend the companies. Yeah. But we, as consumers, can, can you know, make a choice and buy products without it and destroy their business model so that they are forced to change to systems that don't use it. And these systems exist. There is no need for these poisons. You know, I suppose what I want to say, if you know, history will look back also at this civilization and go, what type of civilization poisons its food, yeah. poisons <laughs> its children? You know, how stupid yeah. is this civilization? Yeah. It must be the most stupid civilization on the planet to do that and say, oh, we can't grow food unless we poison it. You know, yeah, it's crazy. Bullshit. And I don't like to swear, but this this is really serious. Yes, we can grow food without poisonous, and we can grow very good food, and that food is more nutritious. And those systems now are higher yielding than the poison systems, the industrial poison systems. Yeah. You know, we have to move away from it. Yeah. It's a no-brainer, like you've been saying and I've been saying. I mean, it's it's profitable. It's good for the soil. It's good for the planet. It's good for people. It makes money. You know, it's, there's, you know, I hear a big argument um, is no, but you know, the yield is not as much, and you know, I can't, I can't make money and sustain my family growing organic stuff. And it's just not true. Well, let's put it in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let, 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 let's give. Let's look at the reality. Yeah. The world is leaking farmers, including the United States. The amount of farmers that are leaving because they are going bankrupt because it isn't profitable. But we, there is one area where farmers are growing, and that's in the organic and regenerative system. Yeah. Every year we're getting another 200,000 farmers around the world. Wow, that's so, a big number. You know, yeah, it is a big number, and, and, and I want to say, you know, we're going against the trend. Why? Because our systems are profitable. Our farmers are better off, you know. Yeah. When I look at where young people are going into farming, on the whole, you know, farmers are in the 60s and 70s because no one wants to farm. They've seen the, the way their parents have struggled with debt and got nowhere. They know they can make so much more money being a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, just being a labourer, yeah, <laughs> than, than, than what their parents make. Yeah, yeah. But now you see a whole generation of millennials going into farming, yeah, because they can actually see a really exciting future. Something that they're their own bosses, where it's it's actually really interesting. Um, yeah, you're they can the make sunshine. their own decisions. <laughs> Exactly, You're free. and yeah. you know, yeah. that is in the organic regenerative systems. You know, we're growing, yeah, and we're growing rapidly. That's why I keep on saying we are a revolution. We are, yeah, on absolutely. every level. Yes, we need consumers to support these new farmers, buy their products, you know, and make them into the most profitable farmers. It's in our interest that these people are profitable, have good lifestyles. And that, that will mean more people want to do that. And we, and we build this change. And, you know, what I'd like to say is put fairness all the way through it, that all of us, from the farmer through to the retailers, through the consumers, we're all getting um, a fair price, a fair return for our work. And, you know, in the end, you know, we're all getting healthy products. We're building a better planet, a better environment. We're reversing climate change. You know, really, this is, as we keep on saying, win, 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 win. Yeah. Where can people go and find more about the work that you do? Uh, on, our, on our website, 
Regeneration International, just one word, lowercase, dot org. Beautiful. Uh, and that, 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 that will get us. Sweet. Well, Andre, thank you so much for your time. It was a fascinating conversation. And, yeah, thank you, know, you too. It's been a great, great time. <laughs>